Thank you. You'll be here. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, <laughs> so just start. Okay. All right. Uh, I think you can hear me clearly. Uh, hi, 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 everyone. Uh, I'm Guan Wu from National Xinhua University, Taiwan. Uh, I'm going to show you something what we call the face field crystal modeling today. So something you might be able to relate to the face field today. today. So I'm just showing you some other possibility that in the future, maybe you are working on, for example, nanomaterials or material processing at the atomist, atomistic scale. It's something called a space field crystal that might come uh, helpful. Space field, so I'm misspelling the title a little bit. All right, so uh, some of the results I'm showing you today uh, is a collaboration work with Professor Gurujan from IIT Bombay. Uh, I don't think we will have time to show you the morphological evolution of grain boundary under electrode strain, but if we do, uh, you can find all the detailed work uh, in this uh, PC review material, uh, material publication which just came out in 2022. Right, so it's workshop, so if there's anything that's unclear, just feel free to let me know, okay? So just a little bit about uh, for you. Uh, my university, my university is so maybe I can use okay. Okay, anyway, so uh, you probably know uh, where Japan, Korea, China. So Taiwan is an island that goes to China. So no, uh, the NTHU, the National Tsinghua University, is uh, at the northwestern corner of Taiwan. So uh, you are all invited to visit our campus. So if you drop by or you would like to give a talk at my institute, just let me know. Uh, I'm more than happy to host you either for your visit or for your uh, traveling. Right. Okay, so here's just a nice picture of our campus. Uh, but actually, if I arrive here, I see a much more beautiful campus here. <laughs> so, meaning uh, it's vibrant and, and much of uh, well life. All right, so uh, without further ado, uh, uh, my research interest is just a little bit about uh, my research interest before we move on to the phase two crystal modeling. So uh, when I was a PhD student, uh, I'm keen in working on condensed matter physics. So um, I love to know like the morphology of, of snowflake. Of course, all kinds of material processing involves a certain degree of the microstructural inclusion. So that's one of my research interests. But as you can see, uh, the bottom three figures I'm showing you here, you can actually see like uh, uh, particles like picture. They are all numerical modeling, and it is like phase field like numerical modeling. So it is not like molecular dynamics. It, it is not. It, it is not a particle based simulation. But we have a way to actually use a phase field like model to generate all these atomistic details and to model maybe uh, the defects evolution in materials or to model like a solid liquid interface or if you have a solid under strain how the surface is going, going to much uh, undulate at the atomic scale so that would be the focus of today's talk all right uh, but i'm from the physics department so uh, i'm not really a focus guy which means i also do a lot of uh, uh, biophysics uh, so that's our point today i think it's out of battery Oh, I hit a button. No, no, no. Okay. Oh. Okay. okay. So uh, we 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 do uh, work work on some uh, biological systems. For example, uh, we just did some work on the dynamics of your heart cell. So uh, I'm trying to find some interesting topic to work on aside from the material science front. All right. So. Uh, this is an outline of the phase field crystal modeling, so I don't have to go through point to point. You are going to see uh, some fundamentals, some ideas behind this phase field crystal modeling, and I'm going to show you what kind of system uh, that is suitable to use the phase field crystal model to, uh, to, to, to study. All right, and if we have time, I'm going to move on to the uh, second part of 
quite tall. So it is still relevant to a uh, uh, material science modeling. So if you have a bite crystal, then I am going to compress the bite crystal laterally. Whether the frame boundary in between this uh, bite crystal is going to be stable or unstable, uh, according to the classical theory, uh, the planar boundary between this bite crystal is going to be stable. There is no population according to the class, classical theory. But if you look at the atomic scale, if you consider more physics here, uh, it could actually happen. All right. So if we have time, uh, I'm going to talk more about that. All right. Okay. So the idea behind the phase field crystal model, right? So first you need to, uh, in this system, you can have this uh, free energy, the idea of free energy, just like a phase field, right? You have this cantilever, the free energy has this double well potential and also the square gradient term. So here is similar. You still only have one field variable per side. Right? You can see F is this integration over the space, plus over two times something times this Laplace and plus one square kernel. Right? So everything is a function of the side. And what is per side? Per side is a density field in space. Since we are aiming for this uh, 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 continuum model that can describe an atomistic structure. So, which means we are expanding this, this per side of solid is actually oscillating space. So, if that's oscillating space, when you see a peak, and that represents this atom here, right? Away from that, you see nothing. So, the feature of this phase field crystal model is going to give you something that can oscillate in space in solids. But when it encounters a liquid, it basically the constant state. There's nothing there. There's no structure. Right? So it's a little bit different than the phase field modeling because in phase field you have uh, two event values that represent in the solid state and the liquid state. But in the solid, it's just a constant, right? Maybe five equal to one, and zero is the liquid state. But in the phase field crystal modeling, you can see the oscillation, and each oscillation represents an atom. So the question is why this kind of uh, free energy can give rise to this uh, periodic structure representing a solid. As you can see here, uh, just conceptually, you can see here you have this Laplace and plus one square kernel, right? So if you would like to have something with structure, for example, if you have plane, uh, a planar wave, that, that is a structure. Or if you have a BCC or FCC lattices, but what is this, for example, what is BCC lattices? So if you uh, do a Fourier transform of that structure, basically you have this uh, 12, uh, 12 uh, principal lattice vector to represent the structure. So which means if I'm using this kind of density waves, right, composition of those 12 density waves to describe a solid, then because it is a solid, then you know there's a uh, fixed uh, lattice basic. So, which means for low density waves, it has to have a specific wave number or wave length. So, you can see from this uh, Laplace and plus one kernel, uh, can you see uh, the mouse here? It's, it's here, all right. So, you can see from here, uh, because all the density waves, you can write that in terms of exponential i, I k dot r, right? So, when you substitute this one into the side, when every time it encounters a Laplace, it's going to give you this ik squared, ik dot ik. So this kernel is going to give you minus k squared plus one, the whole thing squared. So since in a thermodynamic system, the free energy is going to, to is going involved toward a minima. So the only reasonable thing for it to, it to do is actually to find, to evolve the system so that this minus k squared plus one squared as a minimum, right? Because uh, everything here is going to be positive, it's something squared. So it's going to select the plane wave or the wavelength or the lattice spacing that's corresponding to this k equal to one. So conceptually, with this Laplace and plus one kernel, that's quite important. That is something, that, that is a reason that gives rise to this uh, lattice structure, okay? Right, so you, we also have this uh, uh, higher order nonlinear term. But that just gives you, uh, uh, you can change the nonlinearity 
to get different data structure. For example, the simplest form of this phase field crystal is like this, and this is going to give you a stable bodies and cubic lattice in 3D, but for 2D lattice, it's going to favor the hexagonal lattice. But you can change the nonlinearity, maybe to get uh, FCC structure or something else. Okay. Right. So similarly, the relaxation dynamic, I mean, the dynamical equation, what we are using here is the relaxation of conserved dynamics, right? Because the side is the density field, and according to the continuity equation, you need this uh, conserved dynamics. So it is basically similar to the continuity equation. Right, so this evolution guarantee the total density or the F density is a conserved quantity. Then if you look at this free energy functional, we have a side field, but also there's a free parameter F on here with over that I haven't explained yet. But this, there are only two free parameters here, right? One is the total, uh, it is the average density, which is the conserved density. And the other is, is this, uh, uh, actually this should be the Psi here. So you have uh, two degrees of freedom, epsilon and Psi bar. Then from those two models, uh, from those two numbers, you can construct a phase diagram, right? So later I'm going to show you that this epsilon corresponding to the idea of temperature. So if you consider epsilon is associated with the temperature of your system, then the sidebar is the density. So for fixed density in a fixed volume, that indicates the number of particles is a fixed number. So it's basically an NVT in symbol. So the energy here is what we call the Hamilton's free energy. So you, if you have Hamilton's free energy, then you can construct a phase diagram to see for which density and for which temperature the system is going, going to favor like BCC or liquid phase. So uh, that's something you can do. So I'm showing you here is the, simul uh, the, the, the sim simulation snapshot of a liquid state. So liquid state basically the size are constant, so you are seeing no structures here. But if you are choosing the parameter that's false in the BCC regime, then I'm showing you here is the cross section of the 3D structure. So you can see this uh, 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 square arrangement. But if you look at the 3D structure, it is a body center cubic. And the shaded region is actually the coexistent region. So if you are picking a parameter, like you reduce the density so that the system can have a solid liquid coexistence, then you can have this kind of a solid liquid interface, right? But everything here just conceptually is true. You can have this older structure in space mimic a solid state and a liquid state. But the key question is that whether this model gives correct, uh, gives realistic physical quantity, such as the, the linear elasticity or plasticity, or even a defect structure, or the grain boundary or grain boundary motion, or the solid liquid interfacial properties. All right. So that takes the, for example, uh, you are expecting um, the linear elasticity, elasticity uh, is genuine in this system. And why is that? It is because, let's go back to this uh, Laplace and plus one curve, right? So when a system self-organized into the solid state, it prefers the wave number equal to one. But what is the deformation of your crystal, right? You are changing a lattice spacing. So equipment, we are changing the wave number K. So if K is deviated from one, so you can say this is, this is this, this like delta K something squared. Then when you do the expansion, you will see that the free energy, the increase in that energy is proportional to that, that strain squared. So generally you will already see that very quickly. Uh, you are expecting the linear elasticity should be true in a solid state. Okay, so I'm not, uh, I'm not going to show you any derivations, uh, but just uh, from uh, the idea I just conveyed, you should be able to, 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 to see that the linear elasticity is uh, building in this uh, basic crystal model. Um, but how about the solid liquid interface properties, right? So let's check it out. So here is the uh, just simulation of the solid liquid coexistence state. So uh, before we move on to how realistic is this solid liquid interface, 
But first, you can see that just by doing the simulation, uh, the face field crease model exhibits different uh, uh, less, uh, that is planes because you have this crease structure. So automatically, you can have this also the one zero zero one one zero one 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 surfaces in contact with, in contact with, with the liquid. So since you have a, this solid liquid interface, if you your research is is, uh, is about to study the microstructure uh, during the solidification, so you probably know that the solid liquid energy in the in a subtlety of the solid liquid interface uh, interfacial energy is very crucial to the microstructure uh, diffusion. So would this PFC model capture a realistic surface energy and also is in a subtlety? So conceptually, if you want to get uh, uh, this model have a true physics, you can actually starting from something uh, uh, some general physics. So what I'm using here is the density functional theory, which means when you have a many particle system, you can write down the Hamiltonian of the system, which is the summation of the kinetic energy and the potential energy, right? Then you can do this uh, st statistics. Uh, physics, which will give you finally what will be free energy of this many particle system. So, if you still remember a uh, few years ago in your undergraduate study, uh, you know, you can treat uh, uh, the system uh, like ideal gas. But now, if there's an interaction to make the material more realistic, you can incorporate the inter atomic potentials. So, you are expecting the free energy in in includes two terms. One is the something looks like the ideal gas. So you have this rho of rho minus rho term. And other thing you have this, this correlation function that comes from the interaction between particles. So that's quite general, right? So if this phase field crystal can have any true physics, that means in some degree it has it has to reproduce this density functional theory. Right. So we start from the density functional theory. Um, if you consider what is a solid liquid interface or what is a solid state here. So just to make things simple, we can treat the solid as a structured liquid. So it's not like homogeneous liquid, it's an inhomogeneous liquid. But that liquid is not random, it actually has some structure. So if you have a liquid without structure in contact with a solid, which is an inhomogeneous in liquid, then from that point of view, you can simplify the density functional theory I just described. So you can return the lowest order term to the quadratic order, then doing some kind of expansion, right? And very quickly, because you can see from this uh, correlation function, you need the density at different places, right? But if you compare with the dense, with the phase field crystal, this Psi is also the density field. But in this integration, the Psi is always the local term at the same places. But if you do a tail expansion, you can get rid of, of that problem. So if I do a tail expansion for this delta rho of R2, the first term comes out is delta rho of R1. So you can see the structure is now become very similar to the phase field crystal model. You have something psi plus psi and something else, and that something else is actually corresponding to the two particle correlation function, which means the interatomic potential. So through, but still, you have to go through some tedious derivation. But the message I would like to give you is that indeed you can show that the phase field crystal model actually captured to the lowest order the density functional theory of freezing. So that's why here's our results. So if you do a phase field modeling and through the density functional theory derivation, if you just know what would be the liquid structure factor of your material, for example, uh, when we in 2006 and 2007, uh, we worked with this uh, iron, the uh, material iron. And from the MD simulation, we can get the liquid structure factor of that material and also the correlation function. So with those two, with those two parameters, I know how to fix the phase field crystal parameter S. All right. So with that parameter, and I can do a simulation. Now I, I can have uh, something oscillated in a solid and became to a liquid. If I extract the profile of that, right? So that would be the, the symbols, the, the 
the black circles from the MT simulations. And now if I do a phase field modeling with this epsilon, which is equal to 0 0.0923, so what, I act, what I'm getting here is the solid lines here. So you can see that I don't have to, I don't really have to do too much things. I only need the MD simulation input to get this parameter epsilon. But now I can have a realistic uh, interfacial width, roughly it's a 20 angstrom. So it's very realistic. And the reason for that is because the phase field crystal capture uh, generate the density functional here. It will be well representing the same physics. All right. So you can get the uh, realistic interfacial profile, and we also do. We also have calculated the interfacial energy and, and, and isotropy. Uh, I'm not showing you the numbers here, but uh, we are uh, showing that uh, the phase field crystal is very is consistent with the uh, MD simulation. Uh, the results, All right? So you have this very simple idea to formula to formulate this phase field crystal, then you know the solid elasticity is correct, and also the solid liquid property is correct. So the next thing, the fun thing you can do, for example, is to study. Well, it's a pity that I cannot show the movies here. Will you work? No. Uh, Okay, so all right. So basically, um, if you can have, if you know the phase field crystal have the correct linear elasticity for the solid, and you know it also captures the realistic solid liquid interface, the next thing you can do is to to model every texture growth. So on the left is figures from uh, Elder's paper, right? So you can uh, once you have this mismatch between the uh, subject and your material. You are going to see the surface to uh, the planar surface of solid liquid interface become unstable. So what I was going to show you is that uh, this simulation is actually you can see uh, if you start with the material just compressed naturally, you have a solid at the bottom and a liquid above, and you, got, you are going to see the surface start to undulate. You don't have to do anything; just run from a phase field crystal model, but with this lateral strain. So that's the first step. And the amazing thing, which we cannot see here, is that once this uh, this profile become very pronounced, then at the trough, the system, the phase field crystal, can nucleate these locations in this model. So in the very beginning, it's a crystal, it's a single crystal without any defects, but because you compress it, right, and the the, the surface undulates, but when it undulates. At the, at the peak, right? The left spacing can expand, but at the trough, because that expansion is going to further compress the trough. So the trough becomes a stress concentrated region because the, the strain is so large, it's going to create a dislocation in order to release the strain energy efficiently. So this movie was going to show you that the PFC can do this. Uh, uh, because it captures the right elasticity and also the solid liquid interface, so you can see this ATG instability. Aside from that, you can see the nucleation of a defect. And defect can run. It's going to propagate away from your system. All right. And the, the bottom figure is actually because what we are doing here is for 2D thin film, right? You compress that. Uh, the bottom uh, movie should be. Uh, BC signal island formation. So you just prepare a 3D crystal compress yeah, and compress it uh, by actually. So you also can see a nano island formation very nicely. All right, so moving on, I'm going to show other possibilities, right? So although we didn't see defects previously, but here's a, a snapshot showing you the symmetric tilt green boundary in the phase field crystal model. So again, if if you are running the phase field model, so the bicrystal fair is basically you have green one with certain angle, um, so some orientation, then green two will be the other orientation, then they, there you form an interface. But we know for low angle uh, green boundaries, the green boundary structure should be should be formed by a dislocation array, right? And the distance between the dislocations is going to reflect how misoriented those two brains 
right? So here, if you run, just run a phase field crystal model, and here I'm choosing the misorientation is six, uh, six degrees. So you are uh, rotating away from, uh, so you start with a, a single crystal and cut into half and rotate the nearby grain by cross and minus three degree and combine them together and let the system relax. So just by doing that, you can form uh, uh, two kinds of dislocation structures, depends on how you how you set, set up a system. And first you have this a single dislocation forming. And the reason for that is because it depends on what will be your orientation of for your single crystal, then the co corresponding Burgess factor can all is, is confined to the uh, relative single crystal. So on the top figure since we just start from a uh, uh, single crystal and rotating away from that uh, by plus minus three degree, then since the system can form a Burgess factor that is parallel to the interface normal, so you can have a single, single dislocation. And the distance between the dislocations, uh, if, if you use the Bergson factor divided by that, that roughly equal to the result, uh, equal to the disorientation. But what happened to the bottom figure is that if I go back to the single crystal setup on top, but now instead of instead of cutting the system vertically into half, now I'm cutting that uh, horizontally, right? And rotating the top and bottom grain by cross my, my three degree, right? And, and, and from there, because the, the choice of your Burke's factor, you cannot have a single Burke's factor that is parallel to your grain boundary. But by this uh, Frank Bibby relation, you know that the average Burke's factor locally has to be the normal, has to be parallel to the normal of the interface. So the other possibility is to choose two Burke's factor and combine together. So if you're adding up uh, two of the, this Burke's factor here, it's only to give you the sum of the Burke's factor is going to be uh, parallel to the interface normal. So you know, it's, so you know that's what we are uh, we are expecting, and the phase field crystal can generally reproduce that simply. Just setting up the system, you can get that structure. And aside from that, how about the grain boundary energy? So on the left, I'm showing you is the grain boundary as a function of misorientations. And for low angle misor for low angle symmetric tilt grain boundaries, are, uh, it has to obey the Rishaki law. And the Rishaki law basically is the idea is it, it has to, uh, if it's true, then which means your system has to be able to escape genuine the linear elasticity because once you have this dislocation of rays at the grain boundaries, each dislocation represents a singularity in strain or some deformation. Then for that particular Burke's factor to, for that strain to target in the solid, so that's why you have this increase in the energy, right? So basically because of those Burke's factors, it's going to uh, have the corresponding strain field in the solid. So that's part of the contribution to your grain boundary energy. And the other part is from the core energy because you have these, uh, these locations. So if your system can have those two things right, then you should be able to get this reshuffle law. So the figure on the left basically, uh, I'm showing you for uh, the top and bottom figure because you know the core energy will be different for a single dislocation or a dislocation pair. But basically, the dash line is the best fitting uh, to the reshuffle law. So it, it actually do capture uh, the right physics, right? So if you agree that, and if your research is related to solid liquid interface. Is it related to the solid solid interface? Is it related to dislocation motion at the atomistic scale? Then P, the face of crystal uh, might be a candidate for your research, right? What happened here? I'm not so sure about these slides, but anyway. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let's skip this grain rotation. Okay. Um, all right. So okay. So what I'm going to show you on the left was was uh, you have a single crystal in the very beginning. 
and I'm cutting the circular grain in the center, right? So everything, let's say, in the very beginning is zero degrees. So it's a single crystal. You don't have any means rotation. But if you are cutting center as a circular grain and rotate it by a tiny angle, let's say five degrees in the very beginning, right? So now I'm creating a bite crystal. It's a, it's a circular grain embedded in a single, in a, in, in a crystal. So it's a bite crystal. So now, if you are going to make a guess, if I let the system to evolve over time, right? So you know the grain is going to shrink. This typical grain growth problem, right? The grain is going to shrink. So that that is something we actually see in the phase field crystal model. But the next thing is, because the misorientation is only five degrees, so the, the grain boundary, the circular grain boundary structure is formed by an array of dislocations, right? So when, when everything shrinks, which means that all the dislocation move toward the center. And now what you are seeing, aside from grain shrinkage, you also see the center grain rotate. The misorientation changes from five degree to either lower or to higher, right? So by the classical theory, if you are saying, oh, the, the grain is going to rotate, fine, no problem, right? The system is going to reduce the surface energy. That's why you have uh, less and less radius because the circumference is reduced. So the surface energy is proportional to the surface area. So that's why you are expecting grain shrinkage. That's fine. But if you are being implied saying that to, to make a guess, whether the center grain the misorientation is going to be increased above five degree or decreased below the five degree, you might think it's going to reduce. And the reason for that is the grain boundary energy is proportional to the misorientation, right? So when the grain shrinks, if also the misorientation reduces, it's going to really release the energy much efficient, right? So just by the class classical theory, without consider the continuous grain boundary, you are going to expect a decrease in the misorientation. But in the phase field crystal simulation, you actually see the center grain rotates, but the angle starting from five degree, it, it becomes six and seven and eight degree until to a very, very late stage, all of these dislocations shrink toward the center. You are going to see pair and pair of dislocation according to the Bergs factor. It's going to annihilate and disappear. So, I, so we are going, we, we, we see, or we saw that the misorientation increase over time. And the reason for that is because those discrete structure on the circular surface is very important. As I just show you that, if you have a planar grain boundary, the spacing between the dislocation, right, is going to give you the information about the misorientation of nearby grain. The larger the distance corresponding to a smaller misorientation, right? The reason is that, for example, if you only have a single crystal, then the distance between this location will be infinite. But if you start to have a larger, larger misrotation, you are expecting the spacing between this location or how the how frequent the dislocation is going to repeat is going to be much more often. So shorter spacing between these locations indicates a higher misrotation. So go back to this circular case, right? So before ending dislocation and inhalation, we roughly have the same number of dislocations, but the circumference reduces. So which means space, the spacing between these locations decreases over time. So of course that will give you this increase, the absorption orientation is going to increase over time. So what I'm trying, what the, 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 the message I would like to convey to you is basically, uh, if you are working, especially product at a limited scale, Sometimes you do have to care about those discrete nature in your model. So this is just one example to show you that uh, the phase field crystal is one way to go. Uh, the other way, of course, is use MD simulation that will also give you a similar result. So uh, I think around the same time, or 2012 or around, uh, people also show that they, they see this great rotation in uh, MD simulations. So this is the other example is uh, a collaborative work with Professor Gurajan. 
So uh, it's quite interesting that uh, uh, you, you might know the phenomena of grand boundary grooving. The phenomenon is that usually, for example, if you put the ice in the room temperature after a while, when the, 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 the ice starts to melt, you start to see grooves right, on the surface of your, uh, of your ice. And the reason for that is the system is very similar. Okay, the basic setup for this grand boundary grooves is basically you will need a bite crystal in contact with either the paper or the corresponding melt. So, uh, Mullins has a famous paper about this grain boundary grooving, saying that if you have this uh, symmetric cal grain boundary and if you let the system going to evolve over time, you are going to see these grooves. It's going to evolve deeper and deeper and deeper, but the shape of that grooves is going to be remain the same, but only the depth and the width is going to increase over time. So that's his theoretical predictions. But in his work, he has to assume one thing. He has to assume that the dihedral angle, the side here, right, is a constant during the evolution. And of course, he's assuming this continue, continuous grain boundary back in 1960s. But the question now is, if we go to the nanoscale, we are seeing all the atoms. And suppose those two bite crystals has a low misorientation, like here, you can actually see a discrete dislocations here, one here and one here, right? So what is going to happen? Whether when the system starts to evolve, this dihedral angle remains the same or not. So at the bottom, I think, uh, let me see if we, I can show that. All right, so, all right, let me see. Okay, so initially, if you set up this uh, grain volume group uh, simulations, then you can see in the very beginning, you have certain uh, reference uh, dihedral angle. So there should be a line showing here. Uh, I really couldn't get, let me see. Maybe, uh, maybe I can just show you here, right? Can they see it online? So, okay, that's good. <laughs> I will just show you here. All right, all right. Okay, so let's go back. So basically, I can hear uh, the face of Chris can also show the uh, dislocation reaction. But let's go here. All right. All right. So uh, I'm showing you two dash lines here. Uh, the movie should run, but anyway. So in the very beginning, uh, you can see the reference. So, so, so the line indicates uh, this tension line, which will give us information about this dihedral angle. All right. So in the very beginning, uh, you have certain morphology, uh, you have certain shape, but as the system evolves, then you measure the dihedral angle again, you are going to have a uh, uh, different angle. So clearly, uh, Mullen's assumption at the nanoscale might not work. And aside from that, uh, the from, from the Young's equation, the famous Young's equation, saying, how can you predict this uh, dihedral angle, right? It's easy. You have uh, two solid liquid interface and also a solid solid interface below. The three line tension should balance at a triple junction, right? So if you do that, um, in theory, you know the dihedral angle relates to the ratio between the uh, grain body energy and twice the solid liquid interface. So we, all, we, we have all the information about those energies. So from Young's equation, the prediction will be this blue dashed line. Okay, but from the phase field field of simulation, we do the measurement, how be the dihedral angle, we get low symbols, we get all those black circles. So there's a huge difference between the classic prediction and the results on the phase field crystal. So actually dihedral angle predicted by the phase field crystal is much larger than that in the classic theory. And what's wrong with that? So basically, you know, uh, the reason or the the way to obtain this Young's equation, one way to do that is saying the system is going to reach equilibrium, right? So, which means the free energy at that point is the lowest. So, you can do a variation principle to get the Young's equation. So, if we do the same, so how do we minimize the energy? We're just saying that maybe the grain boundary shrink a little bit is going to reduce the energy, right? But if the grain boundary shrink, is, then that will give you a longer solid liquid surface. So, you have to add all the Energy contribution for that. 
But now the problem is that if you consider shrinkage of the grain boundary surfaces, right, and since the number of these location does not change, when you shorten the lens, once again, you are also shorten the spacing between these locations, which means when you reduce that, you also increase the misorientation of your system, which means the grain boundary energy also changes. So you have to take that into account in your uh, minimization process. So once you do that, you can uh, you can uh, you can form a new theory. So which is this uh, red line and also the green dash line. So oh, so that that it, that is actually the take takeaway message is that uh, oh, many class class of theory. Uh, when they propose that class theory, uh, they do not consider the this restructure they are expecting at the atomic scale. So if they miss all the details, so you have to amend all those class theory. So including this Young's equation. All right. So I think uh, uh, that's uh, the part one. I think the, the the main message I would like to convey to you is that. Uh, if, if your research is related to this uh, uh, defects or anything at the atomic scale, then you can check out the phase field crystal model. All right. Uh, so I think that's uh, pretty much for my talk. I think we can stop here. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Ah, that's a good point. So usually when we talk about a curvature driving force, right? Uh, in a sense, we are talking about the brain boundary is a continuous structure. So there you can consider uh, the curvature. But actually, something else we know is what we call the uh, DD, the distal vision dynamics. So if you in, in your system, you actually the grain boundary is composed of, of all those dislocations. So what drive the system is actually the interaction, the, the strain energy that push the all that drives the direction of your dislocations. So in this case, of course, you can say roughly there should be like a, so it's still like a, a, the surface. You can define probably energy per unit length. But if you do have this, this low angle grain boundaries, the driving force is a, the, the strain of your system. So the dislocation is going to move towards to uh, move in the direction that release the strain energy. Thank you for your question. Um, you have here material with the great bonds are common. Right. Right. Uh, have any basic physical model there? We essentially have the PCs on one side and PCs on the other. Okay. Uh, interface. Uh, right. So I think recently there are papers for that. Uh, but the tricky thing is uh, the simple things to use models in three dimensions it favors the PCC. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but we do have a paper back in 2011 uh, to show you how to. A main model for FCC. But there you can have a VCC, FCC, or V system region. So that is you can set up a V system. Yeah. Um, but I, what I would say is that the work on that problem is limited. So there's still a lot to explore.
really like the, the, the 3D product is really important. It's so expensive on this guy. And nowadays, actually, it's a GPU that uh, I would say it's a special way around that. I mean, for instance, it's like you know, a for this system. So uh, uh, back in 2008, uh, I worked with Peter uh, because we want to do this ADP. So for the demonstration, I made a 3D simulation back then. I think it's 128 by 128 by 128. But back then it's manageable. So nowadays, it's pretty much larger. But what is the largest? I don't I I don't have So they learned about the view coding today, so that's a pretty good one. Any questions? Any further questions? Okay, so that's not the case. Let's thank you for the Thank you very much. So I guess we can end the